Hi, this is Kendrick of worldmedicalschool.org. Today we're going to talk about pediatric diabetes. We did an overview a while back on adult diabetes and uh, focused a little bit more on type 2. So if you're more interested in that, take a look at that other video. But we have some special considerations here with children. And we're going to focus a little bit more on type 1 today. So type 1 diabetes is the most common diabetes in children. And it happens to about 2 to 3 out of 1,000 kids. I think these numbers are from the ages uh, uh, 3 to 15 or something like that. And we don't have great numbers on type 2 diabetes, but uh, the most important information about that epidemiology is that it is increasing rapidly. This one study from Cincinnati said that uh, the numbers uh, increased from about 0.7 out of 100,000 to 7.2 out of 100,000. And this was between like 1982 and 1984, or 1994. So in a 12-year uh, range, we had over a tenfold increase, and those numbers are still climbing. So what causes diabetes? Well, it usually comes back to insulin. Diabetes is a problem of processing sugars and, uh, and other, thing, other processes associated with insulin. So if we have a problem with production of insulin or release of insulin or insulin action, then all those things can cause diabetes. Now there's a, a really long list of ways you can actually cause this dysfunction. The most common by far in children is type 1A, which is an autoimmune destruction of beta cells. Now the beta cells are among the islet cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. So if you destroy them, then they don't produce insulin anymore. This is a type 4 hypersensitivity, meaning that it is uh, T cell mediated. But there are antibodies that circulate, like uh, anti-beta cell antibodies or anti-insulin antibodies that you see. And those can be used as markers, but they are, are not the actual causes of destruction. So this uh, there is a genetic susceptibility. We talk about DR3 and DR4 as the uh, genes that are associated with it. But type 1 is actually less uh, genetically mediated than type 2 is. And uh, congenital rubella also has an association with type 1 diabetes and certain toxins. There's a question mark there because this is still being researched. And then uh, basically any other way that you might want to destroy uh, pancreas cells are, are ways that you can cause diabetes. So uh, cystic fibrosis is a cause of diabetes. Uh, you can have, uh, you can have uh, fat necrosis uh, after trauma that causes diabetes. And really there is a long list uh, um, of any way that you might want to damage a pancreas. It can cause diabetes. Um, some Endocrine causes that, you, uh, that are associated with it, like Addison's disease and, and others. So uh, type 2 is characterized by either insulin insensitivity or beta cell dysfunction or, or both. So type 2 is usually associated with uh, obesity. And so um, we're talking about... Uh, having so much sugar available that uh, the cells begin to be, become insensitive to insulin. And they talk about wearing out the beta cells. I don't know if that's actually the process, but, but it also is associated with beta cell dysfunction. You can also have a mixed cause where you have uh, type 2 mixed in with type 1, which can get kind of complicated. And then you have this uh, Modi or mature onset diabetes of youth. And this is actually more common than type 2 diabetes is in children, but much less common than type 1. And it's caused by genetic defects, um, either in uh, beta cell function or insulin receptors or, or other uh, uh, protein defects. So insulin is a signal. It tells the body that there's sugar around. So whenever we take in sugar, 
there are certain processes that should stop and certain processes that should start because now we've got extra sugar on board, so we don't need to be uh, we don't need to be producing sugar, and we don't need to be breaking down glycogen, and we don't need to be breaking down fats and proteins because we've got an excess energy supply on hand. So insulin is the is the uh, signal that tells the cells uh, to stop these processes, and deficits in insulin. Uh, just me mess up that signal cascade so uh, we have extra sugar on board but still we're making sugar and we're still breaking down uh, fatty acids and, uh, and other things that uh, uh, we can use for energy. So um, all, of the, all of the effects, the signs and symptoms that we're going to talk about in a second and all the uh, damage that's done by diabetes think about uh, why it's happening in terms of uh, this excess of sugar that's on hand and the uh, and also the uh, lack of signal telling the cells to stop these other processes so a lot of these kids don't have any symptoms or at least not noticeable symptoms and especially in the early stages of type 1 diabetes there is there's nothing to see because the remaining uh, pancreatic islet cells are sufficient to uh, run the metabolic processes in the body. It's only when you get down to 20 or 10 percent left of your uh, beta cells that you start to get real symptomatic because then the sugar load cannot be compensated by the ability to produce insulin. So this is the point where you get polydipsia because you are um, you've got so much sugar in the blood you can't make enough insulin to get it uh, uh, transported into the cells and your kidneys at this point uh, get overloaded with sugar and they can't uh, they can't pump the sugar back in basically they can't filter the sugar back out of the urine so you get a lot of this sugar in the urine that pulls water out with it so you're losing extra water so you need to drink more so you get the polydipsia the polyuria the polyphasia is uh, is caused because uh, we don't have again we don't have a signal saying we have extra sugar on hand so we're still the body is still saying we need more uh, sugar so you're still eating and you get weight loss because you're not um, you're still breaking things down and you're not storing as you normally would if you have extra energy on board so and then these are the these are the signs and symptoms that happen gradually the acute symptoms that a lot of kids still present with are ketoacidosis <coughs> and in type 2 diabetes, um, uh, HHS, which is uh, hyperglycemic, uh, oh no, I can't remember what it stands for. Um, anyway, this uh, HHS is a um, hyper hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome, maybe. Anyway, what it is is uh, a ketoacidosis-like process that happens more in type 2 diabetes. And hypoglycemia is only an acute presentation of treated diabetes because it's uh, a, 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 <laughs> now I'm really off. Um, it is a, an effect of our insulin, um, exogenous insulin that we're giving. Okay, we're going to move on now. So diagnosis. Um, we're going to use a history and physical to help us to know if we're going to take a uh, test for uh, diabetes. So if, uh, if they have any of these symptoms in the office, then we get a blood sugar test. Um, and it's usually pretty straightforward. The reason I've got a question mark here is because um, if it's so straightforward, then why do we still get all these kids presenting with uh, ketoacidosis? Well, uh, it goes back to that uh, that uh, fact that we don't get uh, problems until the 
pancreas just can't produce enough insulin anymore because it's down to 10 or 20 percent of its uh, capacity and that's just there's a threshold where it's just not enough so um, and asking around I don't know if we have uh, very many ideas about how we can catch these kids before they go into ketoacidosis the good news though is that we've gotten quite a bit better at treating ketoacidosis and um, the fatality rates have gone down from virtually 100% to to much lower. So I, I saw a figure as low as 1%, but somebody told me 30%, so I'm, I'm not sure how good we are at uh, preventing uh, morbidity and mortality with ketoacidosis, but we've gotten a lot better and we're still getting better at it. So the lab tests that we can do, we do have some tests that are helpful um, or that that we could use for screening, but they're just not helpful in type 1 because, um, first of all, you get false positives. If, if we're talking about uh, antibody tests, that we can, we can see that uh, we have autoantibodies for uh, beta cells, then we can say, okay, this person is likely to uh, develop diabetes. But there's a lot of people with autoantibodies that don't develop diabetes, so... So the screening is not helpful except for kids who are at risk for type 2 diabetes. And we'll talk about what those risk factors are in just a second. Um, so the tests that we can do are fasting plasma glucose, which if you have above 126 two times, then you're diabetic. A two-hour post-challenge uh, above 200. And in 2010, they also approved uh, hemoglobin A1c as a diagnostic test. So distinguishing type can be uh, a little bit tricky sometimes in your uh, in your kids who are uh, at risk for type 2 but presenting with type 1 um, and currently that's still kind of based on uh, risk factors and autoantibodies and it's it's a little bit of a, a clinical diagnosis. So uh, the criteria for testing uh, type 2 diabetes is if you're overweight and you have two of the following. So you either have a family history, you are pretty much any other race besides uh, Caucasian, um, and uh, you have one of these signs like acanthosis nigricans, uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, PCOS, or you had a maternal uh, gestational diabetes. So if you have two of those, then uh, it's, uh, it's a good idea to test for type 2. Um, so you start doing this at 10. If they don't have it, then you test them three years later, etc. The differential diagnosis, I left this slide blank because there's a pretty long list. And uh, it depends on what symptoms we're talking about. If we're talking about the polydipsia, polyuria, uh, then you can include diabetes insipidus, uh, which um, is a malfunction of the pituitary gland or the uh, ACTH um, pathway. Um, no, I'm sorry, the ADH pathway, the uh, antidiuretic hormone pathway. Or if we're talking about... Um, uh, some of the other symptoms like the ketoacidosis, then uh, any viral illness can look like ketoacidosis. So there's a long list, and uh, just make sure that you keep a high index of suspicion for kids uh, for type 1 diabetes. So ketoacidosis, why, why do we have ketones? I'm getting into a lot of pathophysiology here today, but I think it's pretty important. So the ketones are products of a uh, breakdown of fatty acids. So why would we have them? We don't normally have ketones circulating in our blood or in our urine unless we are fasting because that means uh, if we're fasting, then we need to be breaking down uh, these fatty acids and uh, producing usable forms of energy. So... Um, one of the things that can cause ketoacidosis is uh, is if you have an uh, increase of, of uh, stress in the body, like by illness, or if you 
have a diagnosis of diabetes and you're being treated and you are not compliant, then you can also run into ketoacidosis. But basically it's just a, a, a process caused by the breakdown of uh, ketones to try and uh, or the breakdown of fatty acids in order to make a usable energy source, especially for the brain. So the signs and symptoms, a lot of times these kids just feel sick. If you have a type 1 diabetic who feels sick, test their ketones, especially if they have any vomiting. Um, if they have vomiting, then you really need to suspect ketoacidosis. Um, and then if you... Uh, if it gets worse, then they can get uh, lethargic, they can get confused. Um, all ketoacidotic kids are dehydrated, so you get all the signs of dehydration. Um, deep respiration is called Kussmaul uh, breathing, is uh, a later stage of keto ketoacidosis, and um, at some point you get an inability to stand. So all these things are reasons to get to the hospital. Um, now, you can't have ketones present in your urine or in your blood without being in ketoacidosis. And if that's the case, then you can just treat with insulin um, and monitor the ketone level. But if they begin to have any of these signs of acidosis, then you need to get into the hospital. And the treatment, the main treatment is uh, fluids. I put insulin first on accident here. Really, fluids is the first thing we need to get in. Because um, you actually don't want to put in any insulin until we have corrected the dehydration. The reason that, um, or at least we've started correcting the dehydration. The reason that we don't want to do that is because if we decrease the blood sugar level too rapidly, then we can have, uh, there's an osmotic process that causes brain damage. So make sure that we uh, get fluids in. Um, watch the electrolytes and don't overtreat. So you don't want to cause hypoglycemia. So speaking of hypoglycemia, this is when you get less than uh, 60 milligrams per uh, deciliter of sugar. It's uh, almost always caused by insulin um, in diabetics anyway. Um, you can get sweating, trembling, uh, palpitations, headaches. So all these things are sympathetic signs, so uh, that's the reason we talk about beta blockers uh, being able to mask these symptoms, so you need to watch out uh, with beta blockers in children who are also diabetic. Um, the treatment of this is uh, glucose, so you can use a soft drink or some cake frosting. Um, and you want to have th those things on hand wherever people are if it gets more serious than um, you can do IM or subcutaneous glucagon. So the treatment of type 1 diabetes, the long-term treatment, the goal is to keep blood sugars close to normal or what they normally would be if you had a functional pancreas. So you follow up every three months to keep an eye on uh, blood sugar levels, the A1C levels. And the most important thing is to tr uh, teach the patient and their parents about how to uh, how to manage this disease. They basically need to be uh, their own no own doctors in order to uh, manage some of the complications of, of type 1 diabetes. So insulin treatment, once you start insulin treatment, you're going to be preserving some of the beta cell function that that's still left. So you remember, you probably got 10% of your beta cells left at diagnosis. And once you bring the blood sugars down, then that beta cell function will return uh, temporarily. So you get uh, uh, a honeymoon period where you are still producing endogenous insulin, um, and that may last months to a year. And so during that period, they're going to be using less insulin. But virtually all diabetics will lose all, or type 1 diabetics will lose all pancreatic function at some point. So this honeymoon period will end and you're going to have to change your dose. Um, kids get uh, 0.5 to 1 unit per kilogram uh, per day. Adolescents a little bit more. We have these different types of res regimens that we used. Um, the sp split mixed and the basal bolus. 
and these are based on the different uh, types of insulin. So the regular insulin that we have uh, has, a, has a peak onset within uh, like a half an hour. And this is the insulin that we make in our bodies. And we have some uh, synthetic uh, insulins that act a little bit faster than that that uh, that we use. And then there's NPH, um, uh, which uh, oh, I never can remember what NPH stands for. I know the last word is Hagerdorn. Anyway, the uh, normal protamine Hagerdorn, something like that. Anyway, so that lasts uh, 12 to 20 hours. It peaks at, at around 4 to 5 hours. And then you have these long-acting ones like uh, Detamir and Clargene. Okay, so a mixed split or a split mixed is going to be when you give one of these short-acting ones like Aspart, Lispro, or Glulysine along with NPH and you give it two times a day, so uh, before breakfast and before dinner. And um, so you get the fast-acting uh, to uh, cover your insulin needs uh, right after this meal. And then you have a little bit longer acting with the MPH that will help you cover you th later through the day. So the benefits of this is that you don't have to calculate anything. You just have a, your daily dose that you take every day. The drawbacks are is that you it doesn't match your, uh, your normal insulin needs. So um, usually in the afternoon with this, uh, you're going to need a snack because you've got uh, insulin but you don't have food. Um, so, so that can cause uh, uh, some hypoglycemia if you don't get a snack. And then as uh, we get a little more confident in our patients and parents' ability to manage the medications by themselves, then we might move to a basal bolus, which will include one of these long-acting like detamaraglargine that covers you throughout the day and then you take one of this, these rapid-acting ones um, right before meals. And that will match pretty closely to what normal insulin would be. The only catch to this is you have to calculate how much of this rapid-acting insulin that you need before each meal. So you, uh, you count your carbs and figure out how much insulin you're going to need to cover the meal or the snack. Um, it's good because it uh, is flexible. You can eat uh, at different times, um, and you can choose what you're going to eat. Um, but it is also uh, more difficult, and more difficult because you have to calculate things, and so it can lead to confusion and uh, missed doses and and complications if uh, patients aren't real good at managing this themselves. So diet, um, exercise, no smoking. Uh, constant monitoring and education are all the key principles in managing type 1 diabetes. Um, remember that snack if you're on the mixed split, uh, the split mixed uh, regimen. Make sure these kids can get treats because otherwise they will uh, sneak them um, and get in trouble. And uh, also watch out for eating disorders that are a little bit more common in type 1 diabetes. Major complications that we're worried about are often caused by uh, damage to the vasculature. And the uh, major theories about why this happens are or include um, the idea that all this extra sugar basically sticks to other proteins. So you get the, these uh, glycosylated end products that build up in tissues, cause inflammation and damage to uh, vasculature. So that can cause this retinopathy, the nephropathy, the neuropathy. All these things are major complications of diabetes. And in a, um, a similar process, you also get worsening of atherosclerosis, which leads to heart disease, peripheral vascu vascular disease, and stroke. Um, and remember that uh, if you have one autoimmune disease, it's uh, a good chance you'll have another as well. So the treatment of type 2 for kids is all about the lifestyle. We can use medications, but, uh, but this is a preventable disease. 
Um, and these kids need to change their lifestyle. And uh, more importantly, these parents need to uh, change what they're doing and so the kids can uh, get better. You can, you can totally get better from uh, type 2 diabetes in kids. So, so this is uh, on the parents and on the, on the patient to change their lifestyle. If we can't control it, then we can use metformin. We can use insulin, um, but the thiazoline dions are not indicated, uh, and I don't think sulfonylureas are either. So uh, if you want to volunteer, um, I just thought of this new way that I think that would be really helpful to other students. So every time you watch one of these videos, please just write a quick question. Uh, that would test uh, other students on uh, the content of the video. So, if you have, a, if you just put that one question in the comments, for example, you could say, uh, "What types of insulin are involved in a split mixed uh, uh, treatment regime?" And uh, then leave your answer, your your question, and your answer in the comments and then we'll compile all those later and uh, and that will be a big help to I think to the other students who use this. If you want to get involved more go to worldmedicalschool.org backslash volunteer. Thanks.